Thanks. Good morning. My name is Rajesh Tandon. I <clears throat> live and work in India. I work with a civil society research and training organization called PRIYA, Participatory Research in Asia, which for 35 years has been promoting citizen participation in governance. Our overarching mantra is governance where people matter. And we work very closely with various tiers of local, provincial, and national government in many areas of service delivery. I want to <clears throat> raise only one point at this stage, which has to do with the first shift. It appears to me that <clears throat> from delivering services to creating platforms may be an aspiration as opposed to a reality. 15 years ago, I led a team in Commonwealth, and Max is where we met at that time, which was a survey of 45 Commonwealth countries. And the outcome of that report was called Citizens and Governance. And uh, throughout the Commonwealth, including its ABC countries, Australia, Britain, and Canada, and of course, it's Nigeria, India, and Malaysia, there was an expectation from the state. And the first expectation was delivery of basic services. 15 years later, in the context I see, that expectation has only hardly shifted from that. And the experience of basic service delivery from non-official agencies, be it primary education or primary health care or access to water or sanitation, even those basic ones, forget uh, <clears throat> some other advanced level of service. The experience of citizens with non-official delivery of those services has not been very positive. And therefore, <clears throat> there is a growing, you, some may call it backlash, I call it growing demand that services of that quality, of that variety, as your survey initially showed, public services are services for public which they can access. Uh, the expectation continues to be that they will be delivered by the government agencies for reasons uh, both in terms of accountability and uh, the quality price variation. You can get very poor quality services at low price. The best primary education centers are where government teachers teach. Um, the ones which only teach English are very poor quality and uh, yet cost a lot. So I, I, I feel that that shift may be more an aspiration as opposed to reality in some parts of the world. And I'll also give you um, a, a set of illustrations as to where new ways of uh, delivering public service are being attempted in India, and what are some of the, the challenges. This light, light comes from there. <laughs> As you go there. Well, the, just to set the context, uh, we are not far from Singapore, five hours flight, but 1.25 billion people, we are the largest democracy in the world. In last election, 825 million voters were registered. We are the second largest uh, population in the world, 1.25 billion after China. We will be largest 2030. And third, uh, we are the third largest economy on purchasing power parity basis. We'll become third largest in of itself by 2030. So, <clears throat> my, the title is very opportune considering what we were discussing. I didn't realize what Henry would be saying. 
basically shifting public service to service to the public because uh, the notion of being a public servant is a very old British colonial notion and of course we were coached very well for 200 years by the Brits. Um, so public servants, that phrase is used but it generally is made fun of because they serve themselves. Uh, that's the sort of general experience. So how to make this service to the public, uh, public at large, uh, other than that narrow public. And just to give you an example, till two years ago, the health service for government employees was part of the primary health budget of the country. So you camouflaged what was actually your own benefit and said this is part of our health budget for the country. Only la two years ago it was finally taken off from that list so that it should be part of the civil servant payroll, you know, it's part of your pension and benefits and transport or whatever. So what are the key challenges? Very quickly, first is that service delivery now is taking place through multiple providers. You have government, you have for-profit and you have non-for-profit. And this is particularly true for primary education, primary health care, and increasingly true for drinking water and sanitation. So if you look at these areas, uh, which are basic, uh, then you have competing. The second important issue, again, flagged this morning, is the aspirational revolution for higher quality standards. Um, we used to get, uh, uh, you know, the plugs for electric cords uh, or electric bulbs whose normal lifetime was one month till people said, this is nonsense. Why can't we have plugs and bulbs which run for a year? So the same kind of aspirational shift because with the liberalization of the economy, people started getting goods and services from outside and say, ah, you can get better quality. But the main driver of this is youth on the go. Our current median age is 24. So nearly 660 million Indians are below the age of 24. And we will become the youngest, we'll remain the youngest till 2030 because China's population is aging faster. So the young people, partly through the, all the technology, partly most of them have primary education now. So there is now a aspirational revolution irrespective of where you live in India whether you live in Delhi or Mumbai or you live in a village. So common aspiration, they were pushing for a demand for higher quality service. And then global competition and provisioning and resourcing of those services. So you are able to, if you take um, facilities, then facility infrastructure is becoming more globally competitive. And uh, of course, the unreformed bureaucracy. We we periodically set up what are called the administrative reforms commissions. And uh, also, I think it's part of the British tradition. The last one was set up in 2008. It produced 13 reports, all very well. Every recommendation of it is worth implementing. Most of it has not even been studied, uh, though the, it is set up by the prime minister, presented to the parliament. So the bureaucracy, by and large, remains unreformed. And, uh, there is an issue which was raised in the morning, and I want to just bring to that, that the character of Indian bureaucracy is changing, but not fast enough. Historically, it was uh, socio and economic elites. So higher caste historically, and obviously those who had access to English language and were economically better off. It is now changing in terms of the social class, but not changing in terms of economic class. So for example, uh, if you enter, the, if, you, if you clear the examination to be a part of the civil service, either national or provincial, your dowry price goes up substantially. So that's an indicator of how valuable this is. So in some parts of the country, especially the, those which are ruled by the left parties historically, like Kerala, that dowry price is now a million dollars. If you join the public service, you are worth a million dollar dowry, dowry. Nothing else, dowry. You know what dowry is? You, girl's family pays to buy the boy for marriage. That's what dowry is. 
yeah, the Nairs are still making it, but not quite. They haven't made it. So uh, within that context, what are some of the emerging innovation? I'm going to give you quickly three illustrations. Um, one is the multiple stakeholder involvement in bottom-up integrated planning. Typically, the planning was being done at the national level or at the provincial headquarters. And then the district level officials only did implementation. And because uh, we have a concept called guidelines, which emanate from Delhi, guidelines actually don't mean guidelines. They mean cast in stone. So what is intended to be a flexible guideline is actually you must do it exactly as it is written, irrespective of your context. So as a result, wasteful resources, outreach to certain neglected groups was not happening, particularly those who are physically remote or economically poorer. So it, it's not rocket, rocket science to do you know, bottom-up integrated planning where all you need is various line departments to say, this is our budget for the year. We have no control over it. Now within this budget, let's deliver the best we can. But in order to do so, you need to talk to people. You need to talk to citizens who are involved, their leaders. So this is something that um, uh, in, in I'm giving you an example of one of the states where on the maternal health service delivery, particularly two indicators, neonatal health care for mothers and institutional delivery of babies as opposed to home-based delivery. And uh, essentially bringing line department, local government, and community together to prioritize where the need was maximum. Community gets involved in reporting who are the pregnant women because the staff is very limited. You know, you have one field functionary covering 5,000 households, you cannot cover adequately. And uh, in the process, the results were very interesting, very good. Within a period of one year, um, uh, institutional delivery went up 30%. And then the state government is now trying to figure out how to take this pilot and mainstream. So it was like a small project. There were one or two champions inside the government who said, let's do it. And uh, that's how this was uh, started. But very simple, grassroots, upward, bottom-up, participatory planning. Uh, no change in delivery mechanism, but just better targeting. Uh, greater involvement of community in delivering services by providing need-based information. They didn't contribute money, but they contributed physical and social uh, capital. Uh, in several of our states, provinces, a very interesting uh, legislation has been enacted called the Service Guarantee. And, uh, it started with one of the states called MP, Madhya Pradesh. And uh, what service guarantee means basically is that for certain services that the government offers to citizens, you know, like renewal of um, driver's license we were discussing, or, uh, you know, getting a copy of your land record, or, um, you know, transfer of your child from one school to another, you know, some of those, um, they, there were benchmarking done through legislation saying this service will be delivered in so many days at this cost. So the, you sort of set up service benchmarking and you say guarantee because you have a right to get it within that. And if you don't get it, there will be a penalty on the line department or official. So <clears throat> essentially the, the main problem was last mile delivery. And last mile delivery had to be ensured through creating service centers where facilitation center kind of thing. This is a picture of a local facilitation center. So essentially, if outreach of a facilitation center with a little bit of you know, computerized digital technology placed in, and community involved in saying that you would support this team here. A couple of local volunteers trained their so they get payment on the basis of services. So it's a sort of a public-private people's partnership model, four Ps. So you have government gives the guarantee. So government 
district level official is still responsible. Actual service delivered through a private mechanism, which uh, receive payment for when you come for service. Uh, at different levels, you know, some are free, some are lower cost, whatever. And the community is involved in a helping establish where the facilitation center would be, safety of people in the facilitation center, you know, a variety of things. Because in the absence of community support, these facilitation centers were like uh, healthcare centers in the past where they will not be in the remote areas and the uh, staff will not stay there because of questions about safety and related. So community involvement in this enabled that. And there are some good, uh, good results arising out of that. And the third is uh, what uh, is an example. So first was the example of a planning approach, you know, community-based involving other stakeholders to do planning of services. The second was an example of delivery through partnerships, public-private people's partnership. And the third is about feedback, accountability issue. And feedback is very important because we were discussing earlier in the morning that if you want to make it citizen-centric, then you need to understand how citizens experience it, whether it is working for them or not, and you need a real-time feedback loop mechanism. So traditionally, Indian bureaucracy is not used to feedback from the community or citizens. It's more used to getting feedback vertically within the department. So there are two examples. One is our Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, in particularly two provinces in Andhra and Gujarat they institutionalized what is called social audit. And this was carried out every quarter. It's a social audit of each project that is undertaken at local level. And community is involved in analyzing the data along with the implementers of the project. And this is particularly relevant from the point of view of uh, bridging corruption loopholes, if any, or delay in delivery, time delivery, in that. A, a very interesting uh, exercise that we are involved in, uh, uh, Priya is involved in with the Water and Sanitation Program, World Bank, uh, is uh, to provide um, mobile-based feedback on supply of water and sanitation services in UP. And one of our cities is uh, none other than Prime Minister's constituency, Varanasi. So the mayor's is in. Mayor is in, it's a tripartite collaborative environment. WSP, the municipality led by the mayor, who is a political elected official, uh, elected person, and Priya. And what we are doing is taking a sample of uh, citizens, local volunteers who are trained and use a mobile technology. And this information is received by the Department for Water Supply and Sanitation and then discussed. So in the first round, we enabled an interface of conversation between elected councillors, officials responsible for water and sanitation, and community leaders, including media and others. And we are hoping that they will make a habit of it. So there will be periodic feedback. This also helps in better targeting and also knowing whether your resources are being uh, put to use uh, at all. So three examples, one on planning, another on uh, a partnership model of service delivery, and third on monitoring and uh, feedback. Quickly, last uh, slide. There is a need to look at upstream reforms because all these are downstream reforms, planning, monitoring, and delivery. Now, what are the upstream reforms? And some of this has been mentioned, but not adequately today, so I, uh, I think it's worth, worth looking at. The recruitment system for public service focuses on bookish knowledge, not practical, social, or entrepreneurial skills. So basically, the same way as you finish your high school is the same way you enter. So you have a set of examination papers. You mug it up. You clear those who mug it up better, clear faster, et cetera, et cetera. But there is no, there is no recruitment process which says, well, can you talk to this illiterate farmer? Or, or this woman is delivering a baby. Can you show your care? For example, all the, all the ideas about care and listening and all, none of that is tested. So, so you, you have a mismatch, you know. Your, your people who are 
very good in sort of writing tests, but don't necessarily bring any other. I mean, they may or may not. It's not. It's not. The second is the rule focus, which we have talked about adequately here. Uh, the external stakeholder orientation has still no incentives for change. So if you don't have that orientation, you will remain rule focused. And uh, the ones who take the risk of listening to other stakeholders are still very few. So in a way, the culture reproduces itself. And the kind of culture shift that we heard from Malaysia it's going to take, or even from France, it's going to take 10, 15 years to bring about that kind of a culture shift. Therefore, it requires 10, 15 years of sustained work. Uh, uh, and we have a large number of public service training institutes, uh, starting from the superior institute in the hills for top-notch civil servants. Each province has a training institute. And there are something like 365 civil servant training institutes in India, including all kinds of functional training, you know, training of uh, health functionaries and this and that. Now, this has not been reformed at all. And uh, bulk of the training uh, in these pre-service and in-service training institutes, the syllabus, the curriculum hasn't changed despite the fact that changes in society, changes in policy, etc., are happening. And the pedagogy of these institutions hasn't changed. So they're still doing classroom teaching, and they're using a curriculum where fresh examples, new stories about these types of new ways of doing um, the work of service delivery have not yet reached. And uh, performance accountability measures, most of the mechanism we have a, in our cabinet secretariat is some, something similar to Pemandu except that uh, our previous prime ministers were not sending phone calls or SMS at night, as I learned your prime minister was sending. Um, we'll see what the new one does. Um, but uh, there is really problem-solving orientation is not part of the performance mechanism. So if people in democracy take risks to solve a problem, it's not seen as something that will reflect in your performance. Um, you know, your performance measurement tools and criteria remain static in that sense. And, and so system alignment from that end is yet to take place. The important thing in our civil service uh, uh, is that while we have a federal structure, it is the provincial level, middle tier bureaucracy which actually delivers. So that's where the incentives are missing. Incentives may be at the level of national secretaries, et cetera, but they make policy. They don't deliver. They don't go out and teach um, in a classroom or arrange for supply of water or drugs to be reaching out in the health centers, et cetera. So for that level, there is not much shift in the performance. Uh, so I think the upstream reform part needs to be attended to. And I'm particularly uh, uh, keen in our context, and I don't know about your other countries, where the, the training institutes, the physical uh, infrastructure of training institutes exists. The budget for training exists. Training does take place periodically, both when they enter the service and at least twice during the service. But the pedagogy and the curriculum and the syllabus and all that hasn't really changed. So that's it. Thank you.